magnetize your minis, flight stands, custom kits, and all the hobby supplies you'll need from the magnetbaron.com. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel for CraftWorldEldar.com. I'm Brent, and this is part one of my 10th edition Eldari Index Review. I'll start by covering some uh, general impressions, some big takeaways on what's changed, and then I'll start in on reviewing the new data sheets by talking about HQs, specifically in this video, Craft Worlds HQs, and Aspect Warriors. I'll follow this video up with parts two and parts three, and maybe I'll need a part four in which I'll talk about Wraith units, vehicles, Corsairs, Harlequins, Yunari. I have to talk about Harlequins now because there is no longer a bright line between Craft Worlds and Harlequins. It's all just Eldari now, which I kind of like. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. If you specifically want to hear me talk about the new stratagems and enhancements, those thoughts are in uh, my video on the Kansas City Open reveal. Those have already been spoiled. So go two videos back, the one before the Eldred video, and you can hear my thoughts on those things. Okay, let's jump in. Big takeaway number one. Uh, I'll just come out and say it. Eldari are really strong out of the gate in 10th edition. They probably have the most reliable and potent hard target elimination in the entire game because of Strands of Fate combined with really strong data cards and also, in some cases, other ways of buffing units, uh, psychic powers that are not any or that are no longer really psychic powers and so on. Uh, much to the delight and consternation of the internet, depending on who you are on the internet, people are either very excited about Eldari or uh, pretty mad about it, especially especially the D-Cannon. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, also, we continue to have, in it, so in addition to really powerful hard target elimination, uh, we continue to have very powerful movement shenanigans. They're not as good as they were in 9th edition, but relative to the other stuff in the game, they're pretty solid, uh, mostly because of Phantasm and Strands of Fate, which I already talked about in an earlier video, so I'm not going to talk about that again, but uh, it counts. We have enough enough tricks in, in the bag to really frustrate an opponent. Uh, lastly, we have points reductions on over 50 of our 60 data cards. So everything got cheaper in many cases. Well, not everything. Most things got cheaper in many cases, substantially cheaper. And that means more models on the table. Although there are definitely some standout units that are obviously going to be early meta favorites like that D cannon. Uh, that everyone's talking about. The vast majority of units in the Codex are viable for competitive play in the right list. It's not like six or seven units are the are the go-tos and that's and that's all we're going to see. In fact, with the exception of the aircraft units, the Wraith Knight, and the hysterically overpointed Webway Gate, just about everything in the index could reasonably appear in a good tournament list that performs well. Uh, I'm not saying that everything is equally good, but I'm saying that everything, I think, except for those units, is probably good enough that it, it could, it really could function in one of those lists. Uh, I, and I think we're going to be discovering new depth in these data cards and in this index right up until we eventually get our codex, which is not going to happen next year. So we're going to be playing with this for a while, uh, within the next year, that is. And, it, and, and that's fine. It's a good time to be a space elf. We have really good rules, and there, there's enough depth here that I, we're not going to be playing elves the same way uh, for the next 12 months, and that's exciting too. Okay, so that's the first. The first big takeaway is just the news is good. The second big takeaway is something that I sort of predicted in earlier videos, but I, I am going to totally commit to is, a, is now a clear reality, and that is that the role of infantry in the game has changed substantially. Nearly every infantry unit in the game that posed a serious threat to tanks and monsters in 9th edition has been modified to no longer be the most optimal, optimal pick against hard targets. Uh, MSU Banshees are a good example of this. So your MSU Banshee units are no longer going to delete an, a totally healthy enemy tank or monster. Uh, instead, now infantry exist to control or take control of terrain, so either to hold on to it or to sweep an enemy unit out of it. 
Uh, they exist to hold objectives, to perform actions, to move block, to counter other enemy infantry. For the most part, your enemy infantry, your infantry, excuse me, is going to be fighting the enemy infantry, and your tanks and monsters are going to be fighting tanks and monsters, or occasionally uh, really booting infantry that are just not in their in their weight class. And that's, that's kind of how the game was back in second ed, right? Your infantry really couldn't scratch enemy tanks. They're kind of two games happening at the table. Uh, and I think that's cool. I think it's fun. I like the weird sort of asymmetry of that. I think it's a fun way to play 40K, uh, but it will take some, some readjusting because things haven't been that way for a long time. There are now, I am going to propose roughly, broadly speaking, three types of infantry unit and I, you could break these into subcategories you could say that they're five or six but i'm going to say overall we're looking at three uh the first is what would have once been troops are now maybe in some cases battle line but even if they don't technically have the battle line keyword or whatever it's going to end eventually end up being called uh these are like very basic uh troops that have high objective control and then some sort of utility power for scoring or for enhancing other units so like think our guardians our guardian defenders get us more uh fate points and then our storm guardians make objectives sticky and they they both have high objective control but they're they're not bad fighters but they're not they're not killers that's not their thing and they're certainly not hard to kill uh this this is i think that every every faction except like knights right is going to have some version of this basic infantry and, and that's what it does it controls objectives and then it contributes some other utility thing and maybe performs some actions so that's one thing um then we have elite troops and what elite troops do is that they excel at killing other infantry so for us this is going to mostly be aspect warriors right uh dire avengers and howling and howling banshees and striking scorpions and swooping hawks and uh shining spears and warp spiders are all going to be really good at killing other enemy infantry fire dragons too fire dragons are like anti-heavy infantry and they can actually do some damage to tanks but for the most part uh elite troops kill other infantry that's what they do third category heavy infantry is infantry that can absorb significant punishment while move blocking or controlling an objective and heavy infantry is interesting because it it's it creates weird inefficiencies in your in your opponent's list because your opponent's infantry doesn't quite have the firepower unless they are specifically anti-heavy infantry like fire dragons doesn't really have the firepower to delete heavy infantry but your your heavy weapons like the maybe six or seven las cannons your opponent has in her army although those would be effective at picking up your wraith guard if they're trying to target your your wraith guard uh, they're not targeting your avatar of Cain and your Falcons and, and, you know, you're potentially on a model with two or three wounds, totally overkilling it with something like, uh, I don't know, a D cannon or a bright lance. So it's, there, there is this weird, that, that you create this inefficiency and that's cool. And that's what heavy infantry is, is there to do, like block, create inefficiencies, control open ground, uh, and I think that that's, I, I think that most of us and most of our lists are going to want uh, all three. You can get by without heavy infantry if you have something else that does that job, but I, I think they're all going to be important. Now, the that, that three category breakdown and the notion that there are two games happening and that they're separate games, the infantry game and then the, the hard target game, it's not strictly speaking true, right? Like Guardian Defenders can now tote around a Bright Lance for free, no additional cost on a platform. And the Wraith Cannons, carried by everyone's favorite undead elf golems, can annihilate tanks and monsters with the best of them. But generally speaking, I think that the breakdown that I just presented holds, for the most part, overall. Uh, I know that some players are having a really hard time letting go, especially of Banshees and Dire Avengers, as just like everything killers. But I actually think that it's better for the game if elimination units are only effective against particular types of targets. It leads to more interesting decision making and positioning and the sort of mental chess happening between the players. It's just a more interesting game if you don't have something that kills anything, uh, especially some cheap tradable infantry unit that just kills anything. Banshees are still exceptionally fast anti-infantry shock troops. Like Banshees have a role. They're really good at running into terrain, 
killing the infantry inside. And if you jump them out of a falcon, I should be saying this when I talk about banshees later, but I'm, you know, I'm excited. So I'm just talking. If you jump them out of a falcon, they're rerolling all of their wounds dice. If you were potentially, you could even doom the thing and then the ruin, and then they'd be rerolling everything at plus one and they'd really be dangerous. Like, uh, they're, they're still good. Banshees are still good. It's just, they don't, they're, they're not, they're not point and click, uh, delete alls anymore. So it's going to take some adjustment and it's going to be that way. I think with, uh, with all of our aspect words. Okay. Big takeaway. Here's big takeaway number three. And that is that Harlequins have been rolled back into craft worlds like they were back in second ed as have Yanari and Corsairs. Uh, there is no longer any such thing as a craft worlds keyword. It's been replaced with Eldari. So although it's possible to run an all Harlequin list, uh, they no longer constitute a separate faction and they make use of the same faction bonuses and stratagems. I, I assume that we will eventually get separate detachment rules for an optional all Harlequin force with unique flavor. But for now, space elves are just kind of space elves unless they're Drakari. I don't let the record show, uh, Trakari, I, I don't trust you with your wild hunt and unseely person abduction. Uh, yeah, yeah, can't you can't you can't trust dark elves. Uh, you can still run a Yanari army by making Yvrain your warlord, which enables you to include non-coven Drakari units. But you lose access to Phoenix Lords, Corsairs, the Avatar of Cain, the Solitaire, and in so you, you trade that for access to some of like two thirds of the Drakari units uh, in the in the Drakari index, which then do not get access, let's be clear, do not get access to Strands of Fate. So I, I think for the most part, I, I'm sure that there's some very clever uh, Yanari players out there, looking at you, Chase Chappelle, who will find a way to make that trade-off make sense and include some Drakari units with really good synergy, and it's going to be great. But I think for most of us, there are there's 60 units 60 Eldara units to choose from that do a wide variety of things. I really don't think we need access to another, I don't know, 20 or something. So Drakari units, especially that don't have access to Strands of Fate in order to make some kind of competitive build. And there's nothing to stop you, by the way, from saying that you're running a, a Yanari list, not making Yvrain your warlord and still including, you know, some of those other uh, units. Because frankly, from a lore perspective, it totally makes sense for Yvrain to be running around with Jane Czar and a bunch of Corsairs. In fact, it's weird for her not to be. So uh, by all means, make someone else your warlord, include her. Say it's a, a Yanari list. The, the bright line between those factions is is gone, but there's, there's nothing to stop you from building whatever narrative you want to build. Overall, I really like this simplification and added list building flexibility that it introduces. Uh, although I will acknowledge that I, I suspect it does distress some of you who play mono Harlequins as you're not getting any reward for downsizing your selection of potential units from like 60 to 7. Uh, and the Eldari faction is balanced with the assumption that a player has access to the full range of data sheets. So it there there's some kind of loss here for mono Harlequins. It seems like they should get a, a little extra something something and I assume that eventually they will when they get their own detachment rules. It, and they are totally playable. They, they by the way, have their across the board four up and vuln save back. Uh, but that might be a little bit cold comfort when I think they're definitely going to be more challenging to play than Eldari more broadly for the obvious reason that you've just eliminated 53 of the potential data sheets that you, that you could be selecting without any additional advantage. Okay. Uh, Next big takeaway. Is this big takeaway four? I think it's four. This one's brief. Uh, what's, what we once called HQ models are much cheaper and overall less heroic than they were previously. This does not apply to monster HQs like the Avatar of Cain, but your, you know, your Farseers, your Autarchs, your Phoenix Lords, uh, these, these are cheaper, but also... Uh, you know, their rules reflect the fact that they're cheaper. I think that many of us are going to be using about two more characters in, in our lists overall, um, but we're going to be depending on characters slightly less overall. I, I, I think that the uh, the fate dice manipulation on the Farseer is going to continue to be super important, 
But in general, at, at least for Eldar, I think this is going to be true for a lot of factions, but certainly for Eldar, as we don't have the equivalent of something like Abaddon um, or the Lion, I think that uh, characters are going to be much more in a, in a support role than, say, your Phoenix Lords might have been in the last edition. All right, final, final big takeaway before we uh, dive into some data sheets. Uh, big takeaway five. <laughs> Eldar can actually be pretty durable suddenly. And this, this came as a, a shocker for me. So unlike virtually everything else in the game that had it before, both the Avatar of Cain and the Incarn have retained their halves incoming damage abilities, which is fabulous. Uh, while both Wraith Guard and Wraith Blades are now Toughness 7 with a 2-up save, they've continued to have 3 wounds. They no longer have wound reduction, but the 2-up the save and the, and the T7 means that it, if something comes in at minus 4 AP, they can still use Fate Dice to save on a 6. And they've gotten cheaper, right? They're, they are com comparatively affordable at uh, 170 points for Wraith Blades and 155 points for Wraith Guard. Wraith Guard are really pretty freaking good now, uh, with also an option to include a Spirit seer, seer that can resurrect a model per turn and give them a bonus to hit, uh, which is crazy. The Wraith Lord still doesn't have an invuln save, but it does have the two-up armor save, so you can you know auto-succeed on against minus four AP weapons using strands. Uh, and while I don't think that a straight durability build is the most competitive play for Craft Worlds, or what we're calling Eldari now, I'm just fascinated that it's even an option all of a sudden. I, I think that more Eldari lists than previously are going to include at least one or two highly durable units to round out our board control options, which is going to be uh, a welcome change from previous editions in which, or the, the last edition in which we are only truly durable option really was the Avatar of Cain, and then the, the Phoenix Lords were like fake durable because of the damage gate. They sort of did that job, but uh, in a weird way, and um, there was a, a moment for Wraith Infantry, but then they sort of got pointed out, and so this is going to be, we're going to have a lot more uh, a lot more options in terms of how we keep units, the sorts of units that we can keep alive in the midfield and, and how we play the objective game, so that's that's good news too. Okay, let's look at some data sheets. Uh, so first in the lineup is Ozerman. I already talked about Ozerman in a previous video, so the only thing that's new to say about him is that he's 120 points, uh, which is pretty competitively pointed. He really trips out the Overwatch for a unit of Dire Avengers. All of the Phoenix Lords give plus one to hit to their uh, relative aspect warrior unit, and that's the only unit that they can join. Uh, at 120 points, Osterman's pretty competitive. If you put him in a big unit of Dire Avengers, that unit would become pretty expensive. Uh, at 140 points for the Dire Avengers, plus, let's see, 120 for Osterman. So you'd be coming in at 260, but they'd essentially be firing twice. They hit on Overwatch on a 4-up, and remember now you can fire Overwatch uh, at the end of your opponent's movement phase. So... They're, they're kind of shooting twice. He gives them plus one to hit, not on the Overwatch fire, but on the, the regular fire. And and then on his own, in his own right, he's pretty powerful. I already talked about his data card. I'm not going to dig down on it again. But uh, he's a solid pick. He's a good pick. He's got one of the only three-up invuln saves in the game. And if you're using Dire Avengers as uh, anti-horde and anti-infantry, it totally makes sense to stick him in the squad, uh, jack their damage output, and then have a powerful melee character that can come out of that ruin or wherever they were into the midfield to counter something else. Uh, he's, he's good. Not an auto-include, but he's good. All right. The Autark. Uh, so we have two versions of the Autark now. The the first one is just the Autark, the regular foot Autark. The, uh, the other Autark is called an Autark Wayleaper, and that's what you get if you put either the... Uh, scorpion jump pack or, I'm sorry the spider jump pack or the swooping hawk wings on your autark that makes it a way leaper it, it's a different data card so the regular autark uh, has one big two big things going for him one he gives you an extra CP every turn if he is your warlord and your command phase so that's five over the course of the game if he stays alive and in in a in addition where 
it's hard to get CP and CP worked is like really important because the stratagems are so powerful. Uh, that's a real advantage. The other thing that's really good about the Autark is that he only costs, I think, 65 points. Yeah, 65 points. So he's good. Um, the challenges he faces uh, are twofold. One, he's he's slow. I mean, he's not slow for an elf. He's seven inches. That's how fast elves are. Uh, but his really his really powerful weapons, as a if you were to use him as a combat character, are short range. So the dragon fusion gun is 12 inches. He's got some pretty good melee. Like before, you can give the Autark a star glaive, a scorpion chain sword, or a banshee blade. Let's be honest, you're going to give it the star glaive uh, at five attacks, weapon skill three, strength six, minus two AP, flat two damage. It's, it's just better uh, than those other options. And you can give him either a Howling Banshee Mask or the, uh, Manda Blasters. I already mentioned what a Howling Banshee Mask does. Gives him fight first. Weird the Banshees don't have it. The Mandy Blasters give the uh, bear devastating wounds when they're targeting anything that's not a monster or a vehicle unit. Uh, so six is to wound just two mortals. That's cool. And melee. Um, but like he's not going to be getting into melee uh, or getting to use that fusion gun much because he's just so... The other issue that he faces is he can only be attached to, uh, like, guardians, either storm guardians or guardian defenders, which are not exactly, like, frontline bully units, nor are they tough. Uh, if you're going to use this guy, I think the thing to do is to make him your warlord. First of all, there's no reason to put him in your army if you're not making him your warlord. Or don't, don't do that. Once per turn, you can target the model's unit with a strat that he's attached to with a stratagem uh if even if you've already used that stratagem that phase but it doesn't make the stratagem free so you'd still pay for it so that isn't that great uh, i guess what pays for it theoretically is that free cp he gives you but if you're going to use this guy here's the here's the way to do it you give him a reaper launcher you stick him in a unit of guardians that has uh probably a bright lance i guess you could use a missile launcher for the 48 inch range and you would rely on like using Phantasm or even Fire and Fade, probably Phantasm because it's one CP, to like move out the Autark and the Bright Lands to shoot something at your opponent, the opponent's end of the table and scoot them back. And you'd really be paying the 65 points in part just to pick up five CP, totally worth it. But I think the thing is you're gonna have more powerful, better units to use Phantasm and Fire and Fade on. And so I think that maybe not a super strong choice when uh, compared to the other version of the Autark, which is really good. The, I mean, this guy has the advantage that he could stay alive the whole game pretty easily, providing a little bit of extra fire for you and giving you those CP. But again, I don't I don't think he's the strongest pick. Sorry, I talked about him for too long. Let's move on. All right. So the Autark Wayleaper. This is the this is the better version of the Autark for the reason that he still gives you the CP, but then he does all of this cool stuff on his own. Most importantly. Uh, he has the Lone Operative ability, which is so powerful in 10th edition. Lone Operatives simply cannot be targeted by enemy attacks unless the enemy is within 12 inches. So this guy's amazing. You could, And he's only 80 points. He's only uh, 15 points more than the other Autark. Um, but because he's got the wings or the jump pack, he's got uh, a 14 inch move instead of a seven inch move and he has access to all the same war gear uh instead of letting you target a friendly unit um with a stratagem you've already used while a friendly eldar this is called indomitable strength of will it's an aura while a friendly eldar unit is within six inches of this model each time that unit takes a battle shock or a leadership test add one to that test well battle shock is terrible that's really good, uh, especially if you're playing against something like Tyranids, which are just going to battle shock the crap out of you all of the time. So uh, he's got a cool utility power, and and he's, he's actually useful as a combat character, <clears throat> especially if you throw the uh, Phoenix Gem on him. The Phoenix Gem, when the character dies on a two-up, lets that character resurrect at end of phase, which kind of like damage gates the phase with full wounds remaining. 
And this guy's got uh, a three up save and a four up invuln and four wounds. So, you know, not super durable, but uh, if you if you get to do that twice with essentially a damage gate in the middle, that's pretty good. I like him with the dragon fusion gun uh, and the Starglaive. The dragon fusion gun is 12 inch range, one attack, hits on twos, strength nine, minus four AP, D6 damage. And then you could of course use a fate die to just simply do six damage. The other uh, enhancement you could consider giving this guy is Fate's Messenger, which allows you to treat a hit roll, wound roll, or saving throw as an auto roll of a six. The reason to do that would be if you give him the Manda Blasters and the Starglaive, you could have him charge something <clears throat> um, and then automatically set one of your wound rolls to six to trigger devastating wounds to push through a few mortal wounds, a couple of mortal wounds. I, I think... Um, I, th I think it's not as good as the Phoenix Gem. I would give him the Phoenix Gem. But uh, the Dragon Fusion Gun plus the Star Glaive with um, the Phoenix Gem, and probably the Banshee Mask if you're not trying to push through um, Manda Blaster hits with Fate's Messenger is the build. And he's, you know, he's fast, so he can also perform actions. He's pretty cheap. I think the, t the toughest thing about the Autark Wayleaper is getting those command points is so nice, those extra command points, that you're not going to want to trade him uh, in the middle of the game because you're kind of giving up extra CP and that's, you know, that's a, that's a consideration. Um, I don't think that's a reason to take the other Autark instead for 15 points less because you could always give this guy a Reaper launcher, have him hang out in the backfield, use him kind of the way you you would have used the other uh, Autark and then, and then move him out in the late game. But he can't attach to units, so that's a consideration too. Anyway, he's really good, lone operative, uh, good combat character, can perform actions, good cheap resource to have on the table. Okay, the Autark Skyrunner. So the Autark Skyrunner, like the Way Leaper, is 80 points. Uh, he also has a 14-inch move, but he's toughness 4 because he's on a bike. Ooh. Uh, and he's got objective control 2 instead of 1. Ooh. Uh, he's got a slightly different set of loadout options, obviously. Uh, you could still give him a Banshee Blade, but why would you? You're obviously going to give him the Laser Lance, which is four attacks, two up weapon skill, uh, strength four, minus three AP, flat two damage. And it's got the Lance ability, which gives you a bonus to wound on the charge. He, he He's going to hit a little bit harder in melee than the other guy. You could also give him a Dragon Fusion Gun, uh, but I, I think you want to give him the Laser Lance. He, he too, if he is your warlord, gives you a CP and he can, this is where Ride the Wind went. Remember Ride the Wind, when he's leading a unit and he can only lead Wind Riders, do not make an advanced roll, it's automatically a roll of six. Now, Wind Riders are good uh, for sure, but I think, the, I think the fact that this guy is not a lone operative makes the Autark Wayleaper just a better bet for the points. Also, your wind riders, uh, unless you're putting, unless you're putting scatter lasers on them, um, are going to struggle to stay out of peril. And you know, th this is this guy's a melee character. He doesn't want to lead around a unit that's exclusively a, a shooting unit. So I, I think the, I think the Autark Wayleaper is the obvious Autark winner here. Uh, but if you if you have this model and you want to use it, it's it's not bad. You know, you could attach it to a unit of uh, Wind Riders with Shuriken Cannons. I think the Shuriken Cannon loadout is kind of like, now that we've seen the points, the obvious move for Wind Riders. Uh, and, you know, have him lead like six of them or something. And then when the Wind Riders are dead, uh, he just becomes a trading torpedo. That's that's fine. I think that's the, I think that's the move if you're going to include him. But I, I think the Way Leaper is better. Okay, the Avatar of Cain. I already talked about this guy in a previous video, so I, I'm not going to linger. But wow, he's so good. He's definitely one of the best, most powerful monsters in the game. Uh, may, maybe the best? He's he is truly extraordinary. Uh, movement 10, toughness 12, 2 up save, 14 wounds, 6 up leadership, 5 objective control, which is like a callback to when you used to be able to put Will of Azurian on him and have Obsec in the last edition. We've simplified and streamlined the rules, so Will of Azurian is gone, but he still has tremendous presence on an objective. Uh, the, the, what he really, he, so he does crazy damage. The Wailing Doom, its shooting attack now is way better. It's still 12 inches, 
but it's got sustained hits d3 so you simply use a fate die to roll a six to hit and it does one plus d3 hits at strength 16 minus 4 ap d6 plus 2 damage and of course you could use fate dice to make any of those just flat eight uh he's gonna go right through most armor he's gonna wound just about anything on either a two or a three uh he's so dangerous and then his melee attacks are extraordinary he's got the he's got the strike and the sweep the strike is six attacks the sweep is 12 hits on twos uh 14 for the strike strength seven for the uh sweep minus four and minus two ap respectively and then that strike attack is also d6 plus two damage and the sweep attack is still flat too so even stuff like space marines are just wading through them uh so he's, he's just incredibly dangerous but what's really extraordinary about him is how durable he is because he's retained uh the halves damage on the attack characteristic or when he gets when he gets hit you have the damage which means, right, that although he has 14 wounds, it's, you know, in practice a little bit more like having 28 as most of the stuff that's going to be uh, strong enough to wound him with with high enough AP is also going to be multi-damage. He's not really, he, the Avatar is not worried about massed bolter fire, right? Because that stuff is going to wound him on a six and then he's going to save on a two. Um there is some, the, the one thing the Avatar is worried about is mortal wounds. Uh, he doesn't have any way of shrugging those off, and you can't give him any way of resisting those. I will say that you you definitely want to put fortune on the Avatar if you're going to... Um, when you have durability characters or units in your army, uh, it isn't enough for them to merely be very tough because the reality is that your opponent will have tools in their army for dealing with things that are very tough. They must be extraordinarily tough, inconveniently tough. And as good as half damage is, if you use uh, Fortune from a Farseer to make the Avatar minus one to wound, well, now even stuff like, I don't know, like Volcano Lances or um, if you were to come up against some, uh, like a D cannon, I think is the D cannon, I think it's Strength 16. Uh, it would still only be wounding them on a four up. The best anybody could ever do against him then would be um, four up to wound. For, uh, he'd have his four up invuln save, and uh, y you know you'd then have the damage. He doesn't have damage though on mortal wounds because that's not um, that's not a damage characteristic. That's a that's a different thing. So he's he's quite vul vulnerable to mortals, but he's pretty competitively pointed. Uh, still, despite being amazing, is 295 points. It's not terrible. You could totally fit him into your list. You just you do you have to be careful around your um, opponent's tools with mortal wounds. Just a couple of other reminders on the avatar. You can't put lightning fast on him to make him might because that no longer is uh, locked out of for monsters. It's just wraith constructs can't do it, which is how it always should have been. So you can make him minus one to hit. Um, in addition, if he's really getting rat rat a tat tatted with. Uh, volume of fire that you can't just use fate dice to beat that somehow like maybe it's coming in at plus one and there's a lot of shots and it's flat i i, I don't know that's an option you could always do it uh but i will say uh fortune is the really important enhancement and then or um buff and then uh he also he benefits remember all eldar have uh one reroll to hit and one reroll to wound simply by virtue of the only detachment rules available to us so he's a high damage uh, low volume of attacks character who's going to benefit substantially from that and he benefits from his own aura uh, while the friendly Aldara unit is within 6 inches of this model he's always within 6 inches of himself add 1 to advance and charge rolls made for that unit so he can move 10 uh, and then when he charges he's getting plus 1 that's pretty good uh, the avatar is going to be a fabulous tool for playing the midfield being a, a bully unit that keeps stuff off your your back line uh, helps you play objectives and high pressures the opponent in the late game um, if you can pick up the units that are a threat to him. If you are going to use him, though, uh, newer players, don't just run him onto an objective in the midfield turn one and assume he will be okay um, because he's he's super tough. If he's the only thing your opponent has to shoot, you, your opponent might, might be able to do it. So have a look at what's in your opponent's list, and before he emerges... Uh, make sure you've either you've done some damage or you're positioning him on the table such that um, he can't be shot by everything in your opponent's army or he's at least not vulnerable to uh, their most potent mortal wound dealing units. Um, you've got to watch him a little bit around those mortal wounds. Okay, Baharath. Uh, 
the bird, the the most the most hated Eldari model by non Eldari players of ninth edition. So all, all all the Phoenix Lords have experienced a bit of a come down. They're no longer damage gated obsec terrors, and Baharath has the additional come down of no longer being able to just go anywhere he wants on the table. Uh, after he he does a thing, after he either shoots or fights, um, which is okay. Let's be honest that that rule is a little bit much. Um, he's he's still good. He has the he he does have the problem of uh, un, unfavorable comparison to his older self. However, here's here's why here's why I think he he still has some teeth. So uh, he has the same stat line really as before. His weapon. Uh, his weapon profiles are basically the same. His ranged weapon has a 24 inch range, four attacks. It's lethal hits, so it's six is to hit auto wounds. Uh, it's assault. Hits on two, strength six, minus one AP, flat two damage, pretty good. Um, melee weapons, shining blade, sustain hits one, so six attacks, exploding sixes. Uh, two up weapon skill, strength five, minus two AP, flat two damage, cool. Um, you know, he's not a terrifying combat character, but he, he packs a punch. He gives uh, Swooping Hawks that he's attached to plus one to hit. And the Cloud Strider ability, instead of the crazy stuff that it did before, gives uh, the unit that he's attached to the opportunity to make a normal move of up to six inches as if it were your movement phase, as long as um, the unit was not within an engagement range, of, engagement range of enemy models and you cannot finish that move uh, and then declare a charge. So here's why I think Baharath is better um, than than some people think. You can stick him into a unit of swooping hawks. If you were to put 10 hawks in the unit uh, and stick Baharath in there, it it would be it would be not cheap, but you would have a, a, a really good tool. Baharath is 120, 10 hawks are 150, so at, you'd have it would be 270 points, not cheap, but here's what you could do. Um, with a 24 inch range, that unit would put out uh 54 shots hitting on twos uh the um fury of the tempest has minus one ap flat two damage so a few of those attacks would be better but for the most part um no ap but there's a workaround for that if you use the blade storm stratagem for one cp all of your sixes to wound will have some ap and uh so you've got the lethal hits so of those 54 attacks some of them are going to auto wound and then when you're when you're rolling to wound, Bladestorm gives you some CP, and then the whole unit can simply for free step out of line of sight, make that uh, six inch move. And there's nothing on Cloud Strider that stops you from doing it if you advanced. So the whole unit could advance, uh, you know, 14 plus D6 do the thing, Cloud Strider out of line of sight. And then once Baharath is part of the Swooping Hawk unit, he too can presumably use the um, Sky Leap ability that the Swooping Hawks have because it just says the unit. And that allows you at the end of your opponent's turn to uh, put the Swooping Hawks into strategic reserve. And then when they come back in at the beginning of your turn, they can come in anywhere on the board outside of nine of an opponent. If you look at the designer commentary that they released, along, uh, released alongside the rules, they clarify that when something goes into strategic reserves in that way, you can with it has deep strike, you can decide whether you want to use the deep strike rules of the strategic reserve, reserves rule when you bring it back onto the board. So you're always going to use deep strike. So essentially every turn, your swooping hawks either, get, well, they can always shoot and then duck out of line of sight. And then you could pick up this big unit that's putting out like 50 something shots and, and put it anywhere on the board at the beginning of your turn, shoot, and then still use the Cloud Strider ability because there's no rule anymore that prevents a unit that deep strikes from then um, battle focusing. That was a thing we couldn't do before, but uh, so that's that's pretty good. You could, you could pick up a Hearth and 10 Hawks, stick them in your opponent's backfield, blast something with 50 something shots that have lethal hits and you could, if you need AP, you could get a little AP on there and then also move it out of line of sight in your opponent's backfield. I think that's actually a really good tool. 270 points is expensive. You could, uh, of course, have the same tool, 75 points cheaper, if you just have them lead, lead five Hawks. I think then they're not um, they're, they're not necessarily as much of a, a impressive damage dealing unit, but just in terms of being able to put pressure on your, your opponent's deployment zone, it might be 
worth doing. Anyway, I do think this guy has some play. I think that the reason that a lot of people think that he doesn't is simply that he doesn't compare favorably with his old self. And it may take us a little while to come around to the notion that being able to move into your opponent's uh, deployment zone at the beginning of your movement phase and shoot something and then battle focus with the unit is actually um, really good. I don't, I don't think he's necessarily an auto include, but I, I think he's solid. Okay, the next uh, non Yunari, non uh, Harlequin character unit is Eldred. I just did a video on Eldred. I'm just going to say that now that we know that he's 100 points, 100 points is pretty good for Doom and three extra Fate dice. Uh, not, not saying he's an auto include, but um, lists that are going to want to build off of that Doom power can totally make use of him with a clear conscience. Uh, he remains a, a solid pick for increasing uh, your mid-table threat, essentially. Okay, the regular Farseer. I already talked about the regular Farseer in a previous video. I continue to think that the regular Farseer is very, very good. Uh, not least of all, because he's only 65 points now. That's really cool. Um, honestly, it's worth it just for branching fates, uh, which is the ability to... Uh, swap out any of your fate dice for a six when you're affecting a unit within 12 inches of the farseer you can do that once per turn having multiple farseers does not allow you to do that multiple times as um well the rule is phrased to not let you do that it specifically says once per turn when you use fate dice to substitute a role made for a model or a unit within 12 inches of a farseer you can do this i will point out that if you have this guy and eldred in your army um, Eldred doesn't have branching fates, but Eldred is a Farseer. And the way this rule is phrased, if you have one instance of it in your army, you can queue it off any Farseer. So if you have, you know, Eldred up in at the back of the midfield and this guy in your backfield, you could um, queue branching fates off Eldred. Fun little trick. Uh, Fortune remains really good. We have a lot of pretty affordable, durable units available to us. And as I said earlier in the video, when you have something that's durable, you need to double or triple down on its durability. Fortune is our most powerful tool for doing that. And having a 65 point model that not only lets you mess with your fate dice, but also lets you put minus one to wound on something is really good. In my opinion, the Foot Farseer is basically an auto include in um, just about every list. There are always exceptions, but uh, I I don't see bringing my Space Elf Warhost to the table without at least uh, one of these Foot Elves. Okay, the Farseer Skyrunner. Uh, so I, again, I talked about this guy in a previous video. Um, now the new thing we know about him is that he's 75 points. And we also know some stuff about, uh, warlocks, which he can lead 75 points is a great, is, is a great number, uh, for a character that not only would give you branching fates if you didn't already have it, but also guide, which allows you to select one Eldar unit within 12 inches of this psyker, um, and reroll the hit roll. Uh, on a on a two up, that's really good. Um, it's it's old guide on a two up. He's also got Eldritch Storm, right, which does some damage. Uh, but I do, and so I think that there's potentially going to be reasons to take him just to have guide. But I, I have some new concerns about the um, Farseer Skyrunner, despite that really competitive price point. Uh, you don't really want him flying around. So Wind Riders came in. I think a little expensive. Wind Riders are 80 points for three, um, which is not bad if you're putting the Shuriken Cannons on them. But if there's no opportunity to just uh, give him like cheap Wind Riders for ablative wounds to fly around with. And the Warlock Conclave is, um, I I think, maybe too expensive. So the way that the direction they went with Conclaves, Conclaves are combat Warlocks. They don't have... They, they don't have psychic powers that buff uh, other units. and they, they only buff themselves. So a Warlock Conclave either comes with uh, two models or three models. It's either 100 points or 150 points. That's pretty pricey. And the only power that it has, uh, buffing power, is Protect, which it only casts on itself. So um, models in its own unit are minus one to wound. And... Because like Warlock Skyrunners are not, uh, incidentally, the foot, the foot Conclave does the same thing. They're they're toughness four, right? They're not with with a four up Envolm. Like 
they're not that hard to kill. Minus one to wound is good. It makes them pretty resistant to uh, small arms fire. But and and then they 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 have some they have some combat ability. Um, they they've got like a d6 attack each psychic attack with torrent, so it auto hits. So three uh, warlocks would be putting out three d6 attacks that auto hit. But then it's strength five minus one AP, one damage. Yeah, each one has a couple of shuriken shots that can reroll the wound roll, and I guess you could for free give them all uh, singing spears, which would you know then have three shots at strength nine zero AP flat three damage. That's that's pretty that's pretty solid, but if you add in the uh, Farseer Skyrunner. You're up to 225 points for this unit, which has some pretty good shooting, uh, some decent melee, has some durability, but like in order to get the points out of it, I think that you need to be able to play with it somewhat aggressively, and it's not a tough enough unit that it's it's not going to get killed if you get really aggressive with it unless it's like on a unsupported unit on your opponent's flank if they make a player or something i i think if you're taking the farseer skyrunner you kind of have to attach it to the warlocks but then when you do it's no longer competitively priced for guide which means you've got to be using it as a hammer uh and its own like long range psychic attacks and melee potential in combination with that of the warlock conclave is such that like it is kind of legitimately a combat unit i mean in addition to the the warlocks attacks the farseer skyrunner has eldritch storm so d6 attacks uh hitting on three strength six minus two ap d3 damage and can also have the two shots with the shuriken catapult and potentially have a spear and all together in melee, you know, they'd have like eight attacks that did flat three damage, but with no AP. I, I, I don't know. I'm not sold on this. I just think that uh, that combo is in the uncomfortable place of not being competitively pointed as a combat unit compared to other stuff that you can get for the same price. Not quite durable enough to be uh, like a, a balanced durability combat unit for those points. And uh, now the you know with guide in there it's it's just, it's too expensive if you're primarily using it for guide on the other hand having a a pretty powerful somewhat durable combat unit that you can play conservatively with in the first couple turns of the game that's then fast enough and dangerous enough and tough enough to really be a problem for your opponent in the late game might turn out to be really great uh i need to play with this i think to figure out whether or not in, in 10th edition this is Overcosted and not specialized enough, or potentially a really useful tool. You could, of course, just have the. There's nothing that requires uh, a, a character with the leader ability to attach to anything. So you could, for 75 points, just have the Farseer Skyrunner fly around and cast Guide, but then you've got to be really careful because there's no character protection at all. Uh, the survivability is based entirely on keeping it out of line of sight. Um, and then like, if there's indirect fire or something, he's, he's a dead elf. So for 75 points, maybe it's not a big deal. That would be the other way to think about playing with this unit. I'm intrigued by the possibilities, uh, but I'm, 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 also, I'm also a little cautious here. All right, next, uh, craft worldy HQ. Uh, no more HQs, but character keyword. Okay, Fugan. Uh, Fugan is the only truly durable Phoenix Lord, and what a delight. He's, he's one of the best ones after having been one of the worst uh, for a couple of editions. In um, ninth edition in particular, he really struggled. I think there was like one top player who took him to a GT very early in ninth and did really well, and after that we like never saw him again. Uh, on a top tournament table, but Fugan's back, baby, and he has he has some tricks. Uh, most notably, he has unquenchable unquenchable resolve. So he has the standard like Phoenix Lord stat line, but 
he gets up after he dies. Uh, the first time this model is destroyed on a two up, set this model back up on the battlefield as close as possible to where it was destroyed, not with an engagement range with full wounds remaining. So he has a two up save, like all Phoenix Lords. He has a four up invuln, but he's got a five up feel no pain. And then when he dies five out of six, he just gets up again with full wounds remaining. And also because he gets set up at the end of phase, it's kind of like a mini damage gate. So like in a single shooting phase or a single close combat phase or whatever, it's just not possible for your opponent to kill him. And so in that sense, he works kind of like Phoenix Lords did in the last edition, uh, except of course that he doesn't have obsec. He's in objective control of one, um, making him pretty solid. Like he's a, and at only 115 points, like this is a this is a good character unit uh, because he's infantry. He can do actions for you, and that survivability really counts for a lot. We don't we don't have a lot of like get up after you die stuff. I think that uh, the biggest challenge that Fugan is going to face is that he, to some degree, is in competition with that Autark Wayleaper who can take the uh, Phoenix Gem. Um, and even with that enhancement, come in a, a like slightly cheaper than Fugin, have kind of similar damage output, but he's got a 14-inch move to Fugin 7, and he has Lone Operator, which Fugin doesn't have, uh, so that he can't be targeted outside of 12 inches. And there's nothing really to stop you from... I mean, you're only going to have one Autark Wayleaper that has the um, Phoenix Gem, of course, but like... Uh, you could you could potentially take a couple of them. Only one would have the gem. And as as like a combat character, I think Fugin might struggle a little bit to compete against that, simply because he has a seven inch move when compared to like a fourteen inch move, and his weapons are all pretty short range. Uh, so that's really that's the biggest obstacle I see to fitting him into a list. Is you have another option for slightly fewer points that is pretty similar. Um, but doesn't have a mobility problem. Like in order for Fugin to really do his thing, he's got to be pretty close to a target. So here's here's his his loadout. He has uh, the Seer Song, his ranged weapon, his like relic Phoenix Lord Fire Lance. And that has two profiles. The beam profile has sustained hits D3, which is cool on um, three attacks. And then it's ballistic skill two, strength eight, minus three AP, flat two damage. So it's going to clean up heavy infantry. It could potentially ding a tank. Um, the sustained hits D3 is, is great. So if you have a 50% chance when you make those three attacks of just getting another D3 hits, I don't think that this is necessarily a great candidate for fate dice. Initially, I looked at this and I was like, yeah, you, you know, get your fate dice out there. But with only two damage on the attack, um, there might be circumstances in, when, in which it really makes sense to allocate a fate die, especially if you have a Farseer nearby, uh, to just auto-succeed on one of those hit rolls to get a, get an extra D3 hits. But at the end of the day, strength eight flat two damage isn't amazing. And I think for your six, uh, your sixes for your fate dice, you're probably gonna have better candidates. I think you're gonna be wanting, wanting to use those to cause your D cannons to automatically do mortal wounds and to take D6 plus two damage weapons to an eight. And so I don't know if you're really gonna wanna get D3 more two damage hits using your fate dice with Fugan. It's a really good ability, but I, I just think that there's too much competing for those dice for it to really be amazing. Um, the he, the So the the Lance profile for the Seer Song uh, has an 18-inch range, melt a 6, so if you're within 9 inches, um, you, do, you do D6 plus 6 damage. That's really great. But it's one attack, hitting on 2s, uh, strength 14. That's cool. So wounding most things on threes um only d6 damage though so here's where you're going to use uh if, if you're outside of so if you're not close enough to get the melta profile that that's where you would want to use the fate die you could however pull out a fate die for the d6 roll get the melta six at half uh range and then just do flat 12 and that's awesome and that's really the that's really where i think fugin shines um that said in order to get close enough to do flat 12 something has to come into the midfield for the most part, at which point you've got all kinds of things that can do that kind of damage. The Avatar of Cain can do that kind of damage. Your D cannons can do that kind of damage. Uh, but the fact that Fugin can't just get up when he dies, like he can he can do that kind of damage, get killed, get up again, 
I think probably the the move with Fugin is to mount him. Either you, you put him in strategic reserves and you bring him in on a board edge, which is, you know, it's okay. Um, or potentially you mount him in a Falcon alongside um, maybe some Howling Banshees, maybe some Dire Avengers, maybe some Fire Dragons. So he he is he's a leader. He can lead a unit of Fire Dragons. Uh, and that's not a bad idea. He causes, causes all those fire dragons to hit on twos. And if they're within six inches of their target, they're really good because they've got the melted profile too. They can really mess up, um, tanks, monsters. I'll talk about fire dragons later in the video. Uh, but I'm not totally sold on Fugen leading around fire dragons because that comes in at 200 points and Fire dragons have to be pretty close to whatever they're targeting. So they are essentially a trading unit. And the issue, when we look at them later, what we're going to see the issue is with fire dragons is that we have so many units that can kill, that basically hit as hard as fire dragons from pretty far away for a similar point cost. Uh, that it's hard to understand why you would choose something that is a fragile trade when you could use choose something that could do the same work from out of line of sight, 24 inches away, or can, you know, phantasm out of line of sight. Uh, from 36 inches away, it's hard to justify just trading five elf lives um, at 85 points. And then if you throw Fugin in there, it's at 200 points. Yeah, he jacks the damage profile. I mean, Fugin and a bunch of fire dragons, if you are pushing through using Fate Dice, the 12 damage on the Seer Song, against something that doesn't have an invuln save, you, you maybe you pick up... I don't know, some like Titanic unit in one turn, but generally that stuff with crazy numbers of wounds does have an invuln save, at which point it's not very reliable. The The one nice thing about Fugan leading some fire dragons is that uh, he can heroically intervene if they get charged in melee. And once your opponent kills him, he like gets up and retaliates next turn. That's cool. Uh, definitely a useful tool. But I also think that you may want to consider sticking him in a falcon alongside some other unit of aspect warriors that's maybe a little bit if you're going to use them at all, a little bit more uh, finely tuned for um, 10th ed, the way the meta is looking and the, the other the, the other things that we have available to us in this index. I just, I think, uh, I think that might be the move. So he's really good. The ability to stand up again in that feel no pain, the durability uh, really do make him something a little bit different, a little bit special, but I don't think he's an auto include and I don't think you necessarily need to attach him to fire dragons in order for him to do the work for you. Uh, sorry, that's a lot about one Phoenix Lord. Let's move forward. Let's move on. Uh, Illic Night Spear is no longer sub faction locked. So exciting! I this is like the model I've probably used the least um, that I that I own in the last two editions. Uh, Illic is a sniper character. He he does the things that you would expect him to do. He does them well, and now we know that he does those things pretty cheaply. He's only 65 points. Uh, Il I, I think it looks fabulous. So he's, he can lead a unit of rangers, right? So you could, you could theoretically run him with 10 rangers. And uh, th this is, this is, I, I think, I think this is crazy. I think this verges on just being an auto include in every list. So Illic plus 10 rangers is uh, 175 points, I think. Um, he has Hunter Unseen, which means this model's unit can only be selected as the target of a ranged attack if the attacking model is within 12 inches. So think about what this means for a moment. So Illic leading 12 Rangers is sitting on your back line in some place, or maybe up on a ruin, uh, that commands the field. Up on a ruin would be great because then you would also get Plunging Fire. Um, if you have a pretty good midfield presence and stuff that w will like keep your opponent out of the midfield, like D-Cannons and the Avatar of Cain and you know other... The Eldar are pretty good at putting pressure on the midfield. Uh, so you've got Illic and a bunch of rangers up on top of something. Your opponent just literally cannot shoot at them unless he, they, they can get within 12 inches, which could be really hard. In addition, and, and that has great synergy with the rangers because the rangers, their long rifles have the heavy keyword. So if they don't move, they're hitting on twos. Uh, Illic also has bringer of true death while this model is leading a unit each time a model in that m unit makes an attack you can reroll the wound roll so think about this for a moment you, you have 10 rangers plus illic uh just just the rangers are all like hitting on twos 
with one reroll for your detachment ability. Um, strength four, so wounding on whatever, but uh, rerolling all of the wound rolls. So even against stuff that's like up to toughness eight, you have a better than 50% chance of wounding with each of those dice. Um, and they have precision, so they can target opponent's characters. They do flat two damage, minus one AP, but if they're up on a ruin, now it's minus two damage for plunging fire. Uh, and your opponent just can't really do anything about it. And those rifles have a crazy long range. And we haven't even talked yet about Illich's weapon, the Voidbringer, which is a 48 inch range, hits on twos, strength six. He's part of his own unit. So he rerolls his wound roll, strength six, minus three AP, flat three damage. Wow. <laughs> so you just have this unit sitting in your backfield that's completely untargetable by your opponent um, with crazy range that's firing 11 shots, hitting on twos, rerolling the wound roll, can target characters. Uh, yeah, it's not going to pop tanks or something with low strength, but even tanks, like flat two and flat three days, it can ding anything. Like this is just, that's an incredibly powerful tool for under 200 points that there's not a whole lot your opponent can do about. Um, even in direct fire outside of 12 inches. So as long as you can control a portion of the table pretty effectively with some durability units and other stuff, which you need to do with Eldar anyway, um, it's going to be tough for your opponent to do anything about this. and Or like they're going to have to throw away something really good and really fast to get it into your backfield um, just to trade to pick up some of these guys. So I think Illich is extraordinary. Uh, he's also got stealth. He's minus one to hit. You know, he's an infiltrator. You can set him up like like the Rangers. You know, you can you can set them up anywhere. But um, but wow, wow, guys, I'm really excited to use Illich. Illich, excuse me. He's so freaking good. And next up is Jane Czar, who is near and dear to my heart as the Phoenix Lord of my own favorite aspect shrine. And there is really one thing that Jane Czar uh, does for the, the unit of Banshees that she leads that's that's important aside from enabling them to hit on twos. And that is, uh, she allows them to use heroic intervention for zero CP. Now, normally that would be two CP and here's, here's why this matters so much in this edition. So uh, heroic intervention has a, a range of six inches, which is pretty good. And when you heroically intervene under normal circumstances, right? Like if, if your opponent charges and then you heroically intervene, they're still going to get to fight first because charging triggers fight first. But Banshees are a native fight first unit as is, as is Jane's are. Uh, and the way 10th edition rules work, the player whose turn it is not, the defending player always triggers melee units first. So back in ninth edition, when you were doing all the fights first stuff, the active player would, would trigger first. And then when you were doing all of the stuff that was already engaged in combat when the turn started, the defending player would trigger first. But now it's always the defending player. Here's what this means. If on your turn, you charge a unit that has fight, fight first, and th th potentially your opponent, in fact, not even just pretend, your opponent will have the option to choose to attack your charging unit before your charging unit resolves, regardless of what else is happening on the table. So Fights First is definitely more powerful than it was before. And that means that if you have like Banshee shock troops out in front of your army being scream screamy murder elves running at the enemy and something tries to like counter charge them, well, chances are the Banshees are going to resolve first. And that's that's pretty powerful. It's, I mean, Banshees are still fragile, so it's not like your opponent can't just shoot them down instead. But in situations in which the Banshees have the opportunity to make that six-inch heroic intervention, it's actually totally terrifying. Because if uh, your opponent tries to charge, I don't know, the Avatar of Cain or um, with some big melee damage dealer or... Uh, your, I don't know, some Dire Avengers or something. If you can get in there with uh, with your Howling Banshees and Jane Czar, uh, you, you will be able to attack that thing first before it does its damage. That's it's pretty powerful. It's pretty good. Now, I, I will point out that Jane Czar is pretty... It's pretty expensive to be buying a Phoenix Lord to get a power that you could have gotten anyway with a stratagem. So that that is a that is a consideration. Uh, it is a two CP stratagem though, and CP is difficult to come by in this edition 
and um, there's a lot of stuff that wants our our CP. So potentially, I mean that that is a that is a powerful enhancement to a squad of banshees. But I will say that because banshees are a relatively fragile trading unit, the 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 challenge that these sorts of units always have is that they have to stay cheap in order to function well as trading units. And when you throw a Phoenix Lord into a trading unit, suddenly it's pretty expensive. I mean, you could you could have a, a pretty decent tank and another unit of Aspect Warriors for, for that cost. Uh, Lake Fugan, you could theoretically also just have Jane Zar uh, run on her own. She could ride around in a transport with a unit of Dire Avengers and, you know, the Avengers jump out and shoot something and she jumps out before it moves uh, and charges something. It's pretty good, but I think the problem is that when you can get a unit of Banshees for significantly fewer points, you know, Jane Zara's 105, Banshees are 85. She I, she only takes up one space in the transport, so that's, that's an advantage. But a full squad of uh, Banshees is probably against most targets going to out perform her in melee but let's have a let's have a look at her uh her melee stats so she she has the strike uh profile and the sweet profile on her blade of destruction they are six and 12 attacks respectively uh they're both weapon skill two it's strength six on the strike strength four on the uh sweep they're both minus three ap which is good but then the strike is flat two and the sweep is one so as as in previous editions, her specialty is clearing out light to medium infantry. Uh, she can probably pick up most of a squad of guardsmen. Uh, if you throw the silent death, the assault weapon first, she should be able to pick up the, the whole squad. Um, and if you charge her into some space marines or something, she's probably going to kill like three of them, uh, maybe four probably four and that's it's pretty good she's pretty good uh however i i think that she's not like at 105 points given the other stuff that you can get for that she's not a sufficiently juicy combat character that that's really enough and having her just behind the front line to heroically intervene would be really good except for the fact that she doesn't have lone operator and there's no more lookout sir so your opponent could just shoot her off the board you can't protect her the way that you could in previous editions and leading a unit of howling banshees as i've all as i've already said uh she becomes a bit expensive or the whole squad becomes a bit expensive as a trading unit that said there probably is a way to use the jane czar howling banshee 200 point combo Effectively, if you're a really skilled player, if you're you're keeping it out of line of sight in the midfield, uh, running with something else that's staying out of line of sight in the midfield, so that if some enemy melee unit tries to run through a, a ruin and engage you, well, the whole Banshee package with Jane Czar can heroically intervene and fight first. They're still vulnerable to uh, fast and man maneuverable enemy shooting units and certainly to indirect fire. So... Uh, I'm, I'm skeptical, but but I think that that's I think that that's the package, or or that's how it would work if uh, you were using it really well. Like it would be a deterrent to prevent your opponent from charging the other thing that's keeping its head down, waiting to come out later, and then eventually they'd make a they'd make a hard play. So she's she's not bad overall, uh, but I think th that she she makes the trading package too expensive. And then if you're using her as an independent operator, she doesn't have the survivability that lookouts are provided in previous editions. So you could run her as a one-off character inside of a transport with five of something else. And I think that's not bad, but uh, it doesn't strike me as one of our most competitive choices at the moment. All right, Karen Dross, or I have, as I have referred to him in the, the past, the, 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 the galaxy's most terrifying Karen. Uh, I've already talked about Karen Dross in a, in a previous video in which I talked about the reveals from the Kansas City Open. Um, he does all the Phoenix Lord things. He, the, what we know now, additionally, is that he has only 100 points, which is quite competitive compared to the other Phoenix Lords and certainly compared to how he was pointed uh, in the previous edition. He can run around with striking scorpions. They're only 75 points, so you could have Karen Dross and a bunch of scorpions for 175 points, and that could be a pretty powerful tool uh so shadow hunter 
I've all uh, he um, adds that's I'm sorry that's the adds one to the scorpions attack all the phoenix lords do that sustained assault each time this model makes a melee attack if it made a charge move this turn a successful unmodified hit roll uh, scores a critical hit on a four up that's really good um, it's it it's not for the whole squad it's for him uh, I'm not gonna again because I've already I've already done my rundown on Karen Dross I don't really have anything new to say about him except that at 100 points he's competitively pointed and striking scorpions simply by virtue of their ability to give your opponent something to deal with on turn one and move block are pretty powerful uh i don't know if throwing karen dross in there um and more than doubling the cost of the squad i, I don't know if he brings enough kill relative to the other stuff in the codex to, to necessarily make it worth the points because Phoenix Lords aren't super durable anymore. Um, but I, I think that the the way to do it is in, in some games, just having the Scorpions in your list with this guy, because he, he does significantly increase the killing power. Having a, a melee weapon with five attacks that's strength eight minus three AP flat two damage, uh, along with that war gear ability, which gives him devastating wounds. Um, that's that's good. He, like he he is a substantial threat to a lot of stuff, especially if you use fate dice to just push through the mortals. And if he's running around with scorpions, just by virtue of your opponent knowing that you have not just the scorpions, which no longer have the like crushing blow exarch. Well, Karandras is kind of the new crushing blow exarch. So simply by virtue of you having access to the scorpions with Karandras, you sort of limit how your opponent can deploy, and then you don't necessarily have to. Um, deploy them to, to run at your opponent first turn and die like you could set them up as counter punchers which is something that experienced players used to do with scorpions in the last edition when there wasn't a good opportunity to move block an opponent uh, to create log jams in your opponent's backfield it's a little harder by the way to create the log jams with scorpions now because uh, units can just kind of like move through one another tanks cannot move through tanks but like infantry units just kind of move through one another so so it is the the move blocking has gotten a little bit a little bit trickier especially with log jam move blocking units that used to rely on like you stop an opponent's unit and then your opponent's units can't get through their own units so they're stuck in the backfield that's a little hard to do to do with scorpions so um i i think that if you if you like a play style that creates uh potentially turn one problems for your opponent and messes with how your opponent can deploy if you're a very like i mess with you eldar player i think that karen dross and the striking scorpions still i i think it's reason i think it's not unreasonable for the points if you can use it really well um and you do always have the opportunity to fall back on them as counter punchers but i also think that uh they're they're certainly far from being auto includes okay mogan ra um yeah, so one of the, the two Phoenix Lords for which we have a new model sure is a gorgeous model. Uh, Mogan Ra did not see much play in the last edition. Like Jane Czar, the, G, G, so GW made the strange decision in ninth to bring out um, two new Phoenix Lord models and make them two of the worst Phoenix Lords we had access to. Uh, Jane Star is still not in a great place. Mogan Ra is not bad uh, for the primarily because reapers have been like cut in half in terms of their cost um i he's he is what you would expect right so he um he he gives reapers the plus one he is a he is a long range danger mouse shooter that buffs the unit that he's with uh he has face of death each time this model makes an attack against a target that's below half strength you can reroll the hit roll uh, and you can reroll the wound roll. He, you now it would be nice if he did it for the whole unit, because he, you know, he's he's pretty he's a pretty significant percentage increase to the cost of uh to the cost of a unit of reapers. Uh, you can get five dark reapers now for seventy five points, which is really good. Ten for one fifty, and then Mogan Raw is 130 points sorry yeah which is compared to the other phoenix lords kind of expensive and i think probably a little bit more expensive than he should be um his shooting attack uh ignores cover the 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 mogator 
I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, it has devastating wounds. Devastating wounds is great for reasons we've established. Six attacks, ballistic skill two, strength seven, minus one AP, flat two damage. Uh, he's he like the Dark Reapers. The Dark Reapers have been retooled to be a threat to heavy infantry. They're really good against stuff like Space Marines. Um, when I initially saw the Mog and Ra profile, uh, I thought, well, you could stick him with some Reapers and you'd have this... They're only 75 points. You'd have this pretty affordable squad at like 205 points that could put out long like long range really effective anti infantry fire and then you would use phantasm or fire and fade to move them out of line of sight um and and that's and that's what you do and the the crazy range will will make it worth just having this like artillery unit in your backfield that you maybe can throw some buffs on um and I think that if you are going to use Mog and Ra and Reapers, I think that is the way to do it. But when you can get a Fire Prism for like 125 points, I don't know if I want to pay 130 for Mog and Ra. Also, I think they should have given a 48-inch range so he could have the same range as the Reapers, I, I especially at 130 points. I will say that if um, Mogan Ra joins a unit of Dark Reapers, I think he too gets inescapable accuracy, so he ignores ballistic skill and hit roll modifiers, but he already had ignores cover with his weapon, so I, I don't think that really matters. Um, I, I do think that Dark Reapers are pretty competitively pointed now. Uh, I'll I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I'm just not sure Mogan Ra is necessarily a competitive addition when you could just throw guide on them or something. Okay, Prince Uriel. Uh, the news is fabulous. Prince Uriel is no longer merely a moody heartthrob who appears on the posters of uh, teen elf girls' walls and never actually on battlefields. For the last two editions, he has been an objectively worse autark, and he finally does something that's cool, that fits with his lore, that is uh, exciting tactically, but also narratively interesting. He is the Prince of Corsairs. Uh, he is he is the old phantasm in elf flesh or metal model from the, around the year 2000 form. Uh, so Uriel lets you pick up three units after you've deployed and either redeploy them or put them into strategic reserves for free. And he's only 100 points. And he's he also can lead uh, either a unit of Guardians or any of the Corsair units, and he adds one to their objective control value. So you could be he could be running around with a bunch of pretty cheap troops, each of which has an objective control of three. Uh, that's great. And he's he's cheap enough that it doesn't really matter if he dies, and also he the, his, his special ability only matters before the game starts. So he could you could have him you know, you, you could at some point you could play hard in the mid table with him and it isn't really a big deal if he gets picked up. Just I mean, just the ability, that phantasm power re redeploy powers are so freaking good. They impact uh but your opponent knowing that you can do it changes what they're able to do with their units. Uh it's especially for more experienced players, I, I feel like the hundred points on him are, are are essentially worth it just for that and the, the extra objective control uh to really leverage something also really powerful it's it's a i'm going to sound greedy when i say it's a bit of a shame because he's pointed appropriately for what he can do but it certainly would be cool if there were some way to attach him to a unit that was more durable uh but i don't want to look a gift pony in the mouth because this is this is pretty cool and he's got he's a, he has a good melee profile five attacks two up strength six minus three ap and then that flat he's in that flat three damage place that uh you you know you you want you want some flat three in your army especially uh especially on melee characters because he is a melee character um my guess is you're going to want him to run with corsairs or storm guardians uh the thing I like about Storm Guardians is that um, they're a bit cheaper per model. Uh, it's 115 points for the squad, so two, 215 with Uriel, um, but they've got the five up invuln for the Serpent Shield, and uh, they're 
you know, they're running around with a couple of fusion guns. The, on the other hand, if you run them with Corsairs, you could run them in a small squad um, and at either 170 or 190 points for the combo, which is overall cheaper. Uh, just have this like powerful objective control tool where you could have them jump out of a transport, run onto an objective, and with just sheer weight of OC, strip it from an opponent at a critical moment. Um, then, but maybe on your turn, uh, you could heroically intervene if you need to with Uriel or like screen him with the Guardians. I don't know. I think. I think the fan the phantasm trick is really the reason to take him, but I think that you can find ways to make use of his enhanced melee control and uh, decent melee stats. You can also just use him as a counter puncher in your own backfield in order to control objectives in the late game um, with some squad he's leading. Uh, he could, you know, you could stick him with those storm guardians that you want to make an objective sticky, uh, and then and then play hard with him in the late game. In any event, I think he's a great tool. I don't, I don't think he's an auto include, but I do think for players that uh, really want to make use of that redeploy power, he is worth it for the hundred points. Um, I, I think he's good, and I'm excited to be able to use him in competitive play. All right, the Singleton Warlock uh, Skyrunner. So, the Warlock Skyrunner has it's got one. He has a Destructor, which we've we've talked about. That's the Psychic Attack, but he has one Runes of Battle power. He has Conceal Reveal. Uh, and it only affects units in his own or models in his own unit. And the only unit that he can join is Wind Riders. So if you stick a Warlock Skyrunner in a unit of Wind Riders, uh, they can ignore cover and they're minus one to hit. Now, if you were going to give a big unit of Wind Riders scatter lasers, like have nine Wind Riders that um, you're going to use uh, Phantasm or Fire and Fade to have them make use of that 36 inch range it really might make sense to stick a Warlock Skyrunner in there for 55 points so that the Scatter Laser, which doesn't have any AP, can ignore cover. Furthermore, if you put the whole unit on top of a Ruin, you can trigger Plunging Fire to give it minus one AP, and then also potentially use Bladestorm to give a bunch of those shots uh, minus two AP, ignoring cover with the Warlock. Suddenly, that's a pretty potent tool. Um, you could, of course, run the Warlock with uh, a smaller unit of, like, Shuriken Cannon, Wind Riders. Um, it's already got minus one AP, but, you know, ignores cover's not bad. Minus one hit's not bad. I wouldn't, though. I think you probably don't need it. But I do think that if you're going to use Wind Riders like artillery and put the scatter lasers on them, they probably do want the Warlock Skyrunner, but I also see that as the only use for the Singleton Warlock Skyrunner. Uh, the Singleton Foot Warlock I talked about in a previous video. Um, this is where Quicken Restrain, when you can add it to either Guardian Defenders or Storm Guardians, and Quicken Restrain only affects the unit that the Warlock character is attached to. Uh, so, like, I mean... <laughs> I guess you could make your Storm Guardians automatically advance six for 45 points. I don't see myself doing that. Uh, the Psychic Attack is good, but it's not um, its not good enough, uh, I, I don't think, to warrant the points. There, there are, like, I'm sure that probably there's some great players out there who will find... Uh, fringe ways to use um singleton warlocks on guardians but i don't if you really needed your storm guardians to get somewhere but it also seems to me like you know we have fate dice so i don't know i'm not i'm not sold i'm not sold okay so that's it for uh characters that are not harlequins not uh yanari and not the spirit seer which i'm going to talk about when i talk about wraiths but i'll just say now that the spirit seer is really good um, the, most of the Aspect Warriors, I was also going to talk about Aspect Warriors in this video, and I will, but I've already talked about them all a bit anyway, because I talked about the Phoenix Lords, and I should have just talked about them in concert with the Phoenix Lords. Uh, so, sorry, that would have been a more sensible way to organize things, um, but we'll, we'll zip through those anyway. Uh, again, also, I've, most, I've talked about most of the Aspect Warriors simply by virtue of covering the Kansas City Open reveal, so you can look at my my other video, but we also know point values now. So I will revisit the ones that I've talked about a bit too. 
Okay. Um, so Dark Reapers. I already said I think that Dark Reapers uh, have gotten a lot better in part simply because they're now only 75 points. Uh, the They have a pretty good shooting profile against infantry and heavy infantry. They're not really anti-tank and anti-monster in the same way that they once were. Um, I think the biggest challenge with Reapers is going to be not is going to be prioritizing them for things like Phantasm and Fire and Fade when we have other really powerful options for that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna make an argument for why I think Reapers are pretty good now. So, and a lot of it hinges on that 48 inch range. The the 48 inch range on the Reaper launcher is really good. There's not a whole lot that Eldar have that uh, can reach out over 36 inches, and certainly not um, much that uh, infantry carries around. It's really just the, the Eldari missile launcher that maybe I think Guardians can tote around on their platform. So um, Reapers have inescapable accuracy. Each time a model in this unit, unit makes an attack, you can ignore any and all modifiers to the ballistic characteristic, excuse me, in the hit roll. And this is good for the Tempest launcher, obviously. And War Gear is all free now, so your XR can take the Tempest launcher for free. And the Tempest launcher is still indirect blast. 2d6 shots. Hits on threes can't be modified, right? Um, only strength four, but minus one, flat one, and uh, the, the fact that like we have a whole bunch of other indirect fire in our army anyway, having a um, with the D cannons and potentially you could do night spinners and you could do uh, the the other the other platform uh, shadow weaver. Uh, so you could if you were playing an indirect fire list and you had a reaper exarch in here, you could be adding some some indirect fire. And that profile, that ballistic skill profile ignoring modifiers is really good for picking up enemy light infantry off of an objective in the backfield. So something like Gretchen standing on an objective, especially with Blast. Uh, a lot of armies, especially that don't have sticky objectives, rely on being able to use sort of super cheap, super fragile units to control objectives so they can put their points elsewhere. And if you can just kill those units, it means your opponent has to hold other stuff in the backfield, keep it out of the battle, um, and have it sit around on an objective instead of playing the game. So being able, especially early in the game, being able to kill those cheap objective holders really can mess with your opponent's uh, battle plan in ways that might not be, the value of it might not be immediately obvious to newer players, but it really does change the math in the midfield if you can pick up those cheap uh, units that just control objectives. Um, in terms of the damage output of the Reapers, the, uh, the regular Reaper launcher still has two profiles, but they're more similar to one another than they used to be. So um, one fires, so the, the Star Swarm, this was the old, the, one is anti-light infantry, the other is anti-heavy infantry, essentially. Uh, the Star Swarm is uh, two attacks, hits on threes, strength five, minus one AP, one damage. So um, especially against light infantry, that's really good. It's gonna hit on threes, wound on threes, uh, punch a hole in light armor and then, you know, pick models up and five Reapers will put out ten attacks with this. Um, I guess you have the Exarch with the Tempest Launcher. So in a unit of five, you'd be putting out eight attacks with that one. Uh, in a unit of ten, you'd be putting out 18 attacks with, with that and that's that's pretty good for picking up light infantry at range. And then the Star Shot is um, uh, strength eight, hitting on three strength eight, minus two flat to this potentially can ding light tanks and monsters maybe but it's more like for heavy infantry right so it's going to wound space marines on hit space marines on threes wound space marines on twos punch a big hole in their armor and then pick them up for every failed save um i think 10 reapers using phantasm or and or fire and fate is probably not optimal compared to what you could get for 150 points but five reapers with the opportunity to get the tempest launcher um at only 75 points it gives you this tool that um in the early game when the board is really dangerous they just kind of keep their heads down and use the indirect fire uh in combination maybe with other indirect fire in your army to pick up light units in your enemy's backfield and then once there's a little bit less and then if your opponent doesn't have anything that's super long range, actually, they can just step out and shoot. Like, if you look at the table and you realize that 48 inches makes them safe, like, go for it. But uh, against, in, in other matchups, you might find that, like, 
later in the game, your Reapers stamp, step out. Once you've eliminated some of your opponent's really um, long-range units, it's at 75 points. I think that this is a tool that you potentially can afford to have simply for the additional deep strike denial in your own backfield, the indirect fire, and the option to swivel into using the actual Reaper launchers if you go the whole game and shoot the indirect fire five times and screen your own backfield, maybe step onto an objective, especially if you're not running two units of guardians, it's enough. So not necessarily an auto include, but I think a very useful tool for 75 points, especially now that uh, those Shadow Weaver platforms are much more expensive, excuse me, um, five Reapers with a Reaper launcher is much cheaper than a Shadow Weaver. Dire Avengers. Uh, again, I talked about Dire Avengers in a previous video, so I'll do this quick, but uh, they're 70 points. I think that's five points more expensive than last time, um, but they're still very good. Uh, the Dire Avengers Shuriken Catapult still puts out three shots, strength four minus one, flat one damage. Um, they've lost, so nothing has Shuriken anymore, so they don't rend at minus two. Um, on sixes to wound, you can spend a CP on Bladestorm, but what, what Reapers have gotten is uh, they've gotten back their not only their better Overwatch, but in 10th edition, you can fire Overwatch even if something doesn't actually charge you. Um, you still have to spend CP to do it. Uh, so each time, this is their defensive tactics ability, each time uh, you target this unit with the Overwatch stratagem while resolving that stratagem, hits are scored on hit rolls of five up or on four up, they have to be unmodified in both cases, um, if this unit is within range of an objective marker that you can you control. Now, if they are on an objective, four up is really good. If Azerman is running around with them, uh, he lets them fire Overwatch for free, and you can use that stratagem elsewhere, which is really cool. He is quite expensive uh, relative to the cost of the squad. Um, I think you'd probably want to use him with a big squad. Dire Avengers are good. They're competitively pointed. They've still got that uh, five up invuln. You can give um, a shimmer shield to the uh, Exarch for uh, a, a four up invuln. And I, I think it's reasonable to at least consider the uh, combination of the Dire Sword and the... Um, uh, mist shield, whatever it is, but or shimmer shield, excuse me, the four up in Um I think personally, I will always go with the second shark and catapult on uh, the Avenger Exarc. I think the squad, it's a shooting squad. It does one thing well. Um, I don't, I don't love when sergeants like multi class into melee when and you have to give up their shooting to do it, unless it's really amazing melee when they're on a shooting squad. I think Emperor's Children, uh, Noise Marines with the Power Fist on the Sergeant is like one of the only exceptions to this uh, general guideline. So Dire Avengers, they're one of the, I think, best tools we have for uh, driving enemy infantry, especially light infantry out of the midfield, being able to, to lay down, if you have 10 of them, 33 shots in the shooting phase. Uh, and then in your opponent's hitting on threes and then your opponent's on your opponent's turn laying down 33 shots hitting on either fives or fours that's pretty freaking good for the points so um not as they're not point and delete units the way they were last edition with the uh sub faction bonus but um they're really good they do their job well uh they're elite infantry that counters other elite infantry and they do have enough volume of fire that they can also um, ding other things for wounds. In combination with Doom, I mentioned this in the Eldred video, the Dire Avenger Shirk and Catapult, if you throw uh, if you throw Doom on the target, if you have Eldred and you're re-rolling, um, it's really good against anything up to T7. Uh, so if you are running a unit of 10 Dire Avengers, that's like another reason to think about maybe having Eldred in your list because it's, it greatly expands the uh, potential threat right that they pose. Fire Dragons. Okay, so I keep wanting Fire Dragons to be really good. And uh, they're pretty good. Uh, I, I actually think they're really good. The, the problem that Fire Dragons face is that we have 
they're competing with stuff to some degree like D cannons and bright lances and uh even even wraiths with wraith cannons because those are kind of cheap now um fire prisms <clears throat> we have so much powerful hard target elimination that uh what is essentially an 85 point trading unit is not quite as compelling as it might otherwise be although um they're pretty good so here's the deal they have pretty much the state, same stat line that they used to, except they're not Toughness 4 anymore. They're back to Toughness 3. Uh, they have the Dragon Fusion Gun, which is Assault Melt to 3. So um, it's a 12-inch range, but if you're within half range, instead of D6 damage, it's D6 plus 3, which is substantial. That's more than a Bright Lance. Uh, they hit on 3. Strength 9, so pretty good. The unusual for... Uh, regular infantry weapons to get up to strength nine that means that at least against lighter tanks or, or like medium weight tanks they'll have a 50 percent chance of wounding minus four ap so they go through infantry armor d6 damage is not really enough against tanks unless you're within half range so they really do have to be up close and personal with something uh the exarch can take the fire pike which i think you're always going to want to take i don't think you're going to want the dragon's breath flamer um 18 inches uh, that one's strength 12 minus 4 and also has melt of 3. So if you're within 9 inches for the Exarch, but really you're going to want it for the whole squad, D6 plus 3 damage. And strength 12 is really good. That means that like even against um, super, super tough stuff, uh, probably stands a pretty good chance of wounding on a 3 or a 4. And remember, you can always use... Uh, dice. You can always use your, your fate dice. They have assured destruction. Each time a model in this unit makes an arranged attack that targets a monster or vehicle unit, reroll a wound roll of one and reroll a damage roll of one. Those rerolls are really good, especially in combination with the uh, detachment power that we have, because it means when you do target monsters or vehicles with your fire dragons, you're rerolling one for our detachment ability, and then you're rerolling all of your ones to wound and one two and you can reroll your damage rolls of one. And so I had said earlier in the video that there aren't a whole lot of infantry in the game that really are effective against tanks and monsters. Uh, Wraith cannons are, um, and fire dragons with the rerolls are. They're pretty effective against something really tough that's like T12 or T13 or T14 with those rerolls. Um, you're likely to get a couple of, you, you know, with some you can get a couple of hits through probably and then if you're up close and personal really that's 2d6 plus 6 damage that's really good um if they have an invuln save you know you might you it's touch and go but they, they, they can definitely do some some actual damage to a hard target they will then immediately die there's nothing there's nothing about this uh unit that really makes it anything other than a trading unit um, an 85-point hard target elimination trading unit is not bad. That's good. Those are those are pretty good numbers. Um, if you're running them with Fugan because you want Fugan to be able to get up and, and fight again after the unit's been wiped out, uh, there might be some play there. But again, I think the real problem that Fire Dragons run into is that why, like, why spend 85 points on Fire Dragons and try to figure out how you're going to get them close enough to an enemy unit to trigger the melta effect to kill it and then get counterpunched and die when you could spend 85 points on a d cannon a d cannon is the same cost and uh, it's got a 24 inch range and you could just use fate to, and you get a free reroll to hit a free reroll to wound so it reroll uh, and then you could potentially just push through mortal wounds um, like a D cannon fires D3 shots at 24 inches and it does it every turn and it's indirect fire and so why am I taking fire dragons I think like that's the, the dragons they, they're they're pointed appropriately to be a trading unit they're just in competition with stuff that doesn't have to die to do the same job um, about about as well. Uh, or if you do want an, an infantry unit that behaves that way, it seems like maybe maybe you take Wraith Guard because those are good now. Uh, so they're not bad. I you know it's just I think there there's other stuff that's better. Um, Howling Banshees, my uh, my favorite screamy murder girls. So. 
Despite what the internet is saying, I contend that Howling Banshees are still good. Yes, they are no longer a uh, point and click, delete almost anything super unit with a sergeant that is the envy of virtually every other faction in the game because that isn't that's not how infantry play anymore. But they have a they have a particular job. They do their job very well. Uh, they're scary. They're very efficiently pointed. And the the only real competitor for the job that they do is Harlequin troops. And when I talk about Harlequins, I will I will talk about the relative merits uh, of each. But I'm going to say right now, I think that it really makes sense to have a unit of Banshees in your list, despite having access to the Harlequin Harlequin troops, which which do something similar. So here, here's what Banshees do: they they're a fast melee unit that can run through opaque walls into ruins to enemy units that were not at all visible and they can annihilate enemy light and medium infantry units that's that that's what they're there for the other thing that they can do they're like a they're like a melee shock troop unit so if you have a line of banshees in front of opaque terrain they are uh, a surety against your opponent trying to engage whatever is behind the terrain and melee like they're they're a great melee vanguard if they're out of line of sight for the simple reason that they have fight first and uh as i as i mentioned when i was talking about jane czar because of how 10th edition rules work the defender has the opportunity even if charged to activate their fight first unit first so like you don't even have to if if you have your banshees screening behind a ruin and something charges you like goes through the ruin to try to engage the stuff behind the ruin uh your banshees just get to get to smack that thing down and if it's coming through a ruin it's probably not a vehicle or a monster so probably whatever it is that's coming at you your banshees can either kill it or really mess it up so they're, they're an incredible like melee vanguard deterrent uh and then when they actually make their play they they're fast enough and they hit hard enough uh, to root enemy infantry out of terrain. That's what they do. They screen your stuff that is out of line of sight from enemy vast enemy melee infantry, and they root enemy infantry out of terrain where they're completely invisible. Like if you, yeah, if something's in a ruin or something and you can shoot it, you don't need to send your banshees in there because we have great shooting. But it's the it's like an ITC play. The first floor of ruins are completely opaque when they're in the opponent's deployment zone. There are plenty of ruins that you're going to find on the board where you can't just, there is no true line of sight into the ruins. So being able to send melee units in uh, is, is important. Uh, let's talk stats. So they are, they're acrobatic. They can, which makes them eligible to declare a charge and a turn in which they advanced or fell back. Uh, the, the advanced part is the really important part of that. They frequently won't survive to, uh, your, your opponent, if you, when you charge with your banshees, they're probably they're probably done. So the fallback thing is, is less key, but can also matter. Uh, you can use a strands of fate die to guarantee that they they get a good result. So they they really move. So you can move them twenty inches across the board uh, if you figure um, on on average. So if you figure they've got a they have an eight inch move, you can guarantee their advance roll is. Uh, a six with strands of fate taking you to a 14 and then if you were to use a strands die on the charge you could affect one of the die the worst thing you could end up with would be a 20 i said 20 i guess 21 inches and then they have good damage output so uh an msu squad the regular banshees between them will put out 12 attacks hitting on threes strength four minus three ap love the minus three ap one damage if you pop them out of a falcon, I really like banshees and falcons. Then they're not screening, yes, but like, because they get to reroll the wound roll, so that strength four suddenly becomes really good. So at that point, anything T seven and down, they have a, a more than fifty percent chance of wounding. So even even stuff like light light monsters and very light uh, vehicles, like the equivalent of a viper or something, they can do some real damage to. Uh, one damage on the regular banshees, but then the the exarch can either have the executioner or mere swords and i am sorry to report ninth edition players who built all of their banshees with mere swords because why wouldn't you uh i am i have three squads of the new sculpt banshees with mere swords so i'm i'm feeling the the pain on this too uh the executioner is is the the better pick 
because the so the way it works the executioner is four attacks hitting on three is strength five so that's good minus two ap then flat two the mirror swords are just like the banshee blade but they they double the attack output uh it's like it's just an extra banshee blade and so it's six attacks instead of four attacks with the executioner but it's only and it's minus three ap instead of minus two but it's only one damage now obviously against one wound infantry yes the mirror swords are better and i guess if your local meta is filled with one wound infantry and that's what you know you're going to be using them on then enjoy continuing to have your mirror swords but most of us are going to want the opportunity to use our banshees against stuff like space marines uh and having a sergeant who's putting out four strength five attacks minus two flat two significantly increases your odds of being able to just wipe a squad of say five marines shooting from cover like your banshees especially if you get in there with some fate dice just a little bit your banshees should be able to pick up that whole squad uh especially given that with the detachment bonus that we have they get one reroll to hit and one reroll to wound so if you're doing that on the executioner um you stand a pretty good chance of picking up maybe like three marines with the executioner and then the the remaining four banshees between them um can probably get through four wounds on the last two uh especially you know if you have to you can finally cheat it with a fate die um but having a, a damage profile on them that allows them to wipe a squad of medium weight infantry reasonably reliably makes the executioner worth having and i i am going to struggle to take my uh old sculpt banshee exarchs with the executioners and plop them in the middle of my new sculpt banshee squads with the mirror with and not run the mirror sword guy and have my exarch be slightly smaller than everybody else and just feel weird about it but I also can't bring myself when I already own three of those squads to just like buy boxes to build new Exarch models. I mean, I guess I could pull the, like dissolve the glue and pull the arms off the previous, uh, the, the mirror sword ones, but who knows what'll happen in 10th edition and they look great and I don't want to do it. But I suspect that some of you out there in YouTube land will be doing exactly that. So Banshees, Banshees are good. They're, they, they do a job. And don't forget, I mentioned this in the Jane Zar section, but even if you're not running Jane Zar with them, you can always spend two CP to have them heroically intervene six inches and jump an enemy unit that's come through a unit or a ruin to attack something of yours. And because they have fight first, even, even on your opponent's turn as the defending player, they will get to activate first. Two CP is a lot, but wow, that can re that could turn an entire game in your favor. If you're if you can heroically intervene six inches with your banshees and kill something that was going to take out some key character or or other unit, so keep it in mind. It's there as an option. Uh, let's see. What does that leave for aspect warriors? Okay, we haven't done striking scorpions. I, t I talked about scorpions though when I talked about Karen Dross, and I think I talked about them in a previous video. Um, but now we know point costs. Uh, there's 75 points for the squad, which is very aggressively pointed, very competitively pointed, cheaper than Banshees. They still infiltrate. They still have the Manda Blasters. Um, I don't know if it's, like I said earlier in the video, I don't know if it's worth having Karen Dross lead them for more than double the cost of the squad. Uh, I think a, a, a very good player could probably make that work effectively. But I think anybody can get good use out of uh, five striking scorpions for 75 points. The regular biting blade, um, so uh, like before with the infiltration ability, they can set up like nine inches from your opponent. And if you get uh, first turn, you know, if you don't get first turn, theoretically, they could run away with phantasm. Um, if you do get first turn, uh, that you know, they, they go for it. And if, if everything goes pear-shaped, 75 points isn't that crazy to give up. Uh, the regular scorpion biting blade is five attacks sustained hits one so exploding sixes um hits on threes strength five minus one ap and i'm sorry the bite this is the exarch weapon the biting blade still flat two damage so the uh the scorpions i think the what the exarch does like with the banshees is it provides like anti-heavy infantry dimension to the squad and then the regular Scorpion Chain Sword is four attacks with Exploding Sixes, Strength Four, no AP, which isn't great. Um, one damage, really good against Light Infantry, but uh, they sort of get around that with the Manda Blaster ability. 
Melee weapons equipped by the bear have the devastating wounds ability when targeting um, anything that's not a monster or a vehicle. So they don't have any AP, but it's reasonably high volume of attacks, right? You're putting out 25 attacks with exploding sixes. Uh, I'm sorry, because I'm doing it as though the Exarch is a sixth model. Uh, 21 attacks with exploding sixes, and then you get one reroll for the detachment ability, you get one reroll to wound, and all of the wounds that do go through, well, the sixes are going to immediately go to mortals. And so um, any any infantry in the game is going to get, uh, certainly any lighter medium weight infantry, pretty messed up by a unit of scorpions. You could, if you want, swap that uh, biting blade for the claw. The claw has a mediocre shooting profile that's basically a shuriken catapult. And then... Um, uh, also has sustained hits one is uh however strength eight minus two flat two so you're trading out uh one attack and it's now one minus one to hit but you're getting strength eight and and one more ap um i i'm probably gonna stick with the biting blade i have i have an exarch built with each of them so you know maybe maybe i'll mess around but um i don't i don't love the four up weapon skill without a without a bonus uh so i'm i'm probably probably going to go with the biting blade uh but yeah 75 points they're good move blockers they are a good deterrent for um how your opponent deploys and they're cheap enough that uh you can really use them to to play a control game to mess with what your opponent can how your opponent can deploy and to stop them from being where they need to be early on they don't have to kill a lot of stuff to earn their points which is good because they're not they're not super killy um but they'll also be good for screening out you you need units to infiltrate just to screen out your opponent's infiltrators because when an infiltrator is positioned on the board uh it can't be positioned within nine inches of other infiltrators which is also a reason why when your opponent has infiltrators you always want to deploy your infiltrators before you deploy other stuff so you can create these bubbles in front of your army where you can't be threatened by infiltrating units and scorpions are also going to be good for that they can stay out of line of sight in the midfield screen your front line um act as counter punchers uh be somewhat disposable objective control like uh they're good. They're useful. They're just performing the role that inf infantry performed in 10th edition, not the role that elite infantry performed in 9th edition. Not auto includes, but but a solid useful tool for the points. Okay, swooping hawks. Uh, so, like Baharath, swooping hawks are not quite as ridiculously good as they were in the previous edition, but I think they're really good. I think that uh, lots of people are getting caught up on how on the fact that they're not essentially like game breaking anymore before the um point hike and uh may maybe not crediting them with having them the, the utility that they have they're really good so um for one thing you you can get five swooping hawks for only 75 points which seems to be the going rate for uh aspect warriors and they still they still have just crazy mobility they can't shoot and then fly away before you can shoot them back which was ridiculous and they, they don't there's no way to drop grenades anymore hopefully when we'll when we get the codex we'll get some some way to do that um and they have they have grenade but uh there's no like ankle bracelet of grenades like i kick grenades off on you that's been a swooping hawk staple all the way back to second end so just narratively i'd like to have that back but um in terms of what they do for you on the table uh, they're super good. So Sky Leap, their thing, I talked about this when I talked about Parth, is that at the end of your opponent's turn, they go back into, if you want them to, strategic reserves so that when you get to the end of your own movement phase, you can bring them in as reinforcements. And because they have the deep strike keyword and they've clarified in the designer commentary, uh, you can bring them in as deep strikers. So they could, they could deep strike every turn you know outside of nine inches wherever you need them to be and although they don't have ap on the majority of their weapons um they have volume of fire and so they're a constant threat to fragile infantry units in your opponent's backfield which means you're just for the whole game you have this unit that at any time you can just move into your opponent's backfield 
and just hose things with fire. Um, the Hawks are a place where I'm a, I, I think the, the new limitations on squad design hurt a little bit because you either have to take five Hawks or 10 Hawks because everything now comes in like in Sigmar, right? Um, there are a lot of ways in which they've made 40K like Sigmar. Uh, you, you have to buy, because it would be great if you could take like seven Hawks. Uh, but then I'll talk about why in just a moment. Um, so swooping Hawks have, the regular Hawks have Laz Blasters, which are, I think it's the same stat line as before. 24 inches, four attacks, uh, strength four, no AP, one damage. And then the Hawks, the the uh, Exarch has the Hawks Talon, which is the same thing, but it's strength five, just to make you roll those dice separately, which is fakely annoying. Um, they all have lethal hits, so six is to hit uh, auto wound. And you can give the um, Swooping Hawk Exarch uh, an Aldari Power Sword, and there's absolutely no reason not to do that uh, now because it's free, So and it doesn't replace anything. And so the, the point cost for 75 points, you get this unit that's putting out uh, 20 attacks, sixes to hit auto wound, and um, our strength four mostly, and then strength five for a few of them. One reroll to hit, one reroll to wound. It's, it's almost enough to like reliably wipe a unit of guardsmen, but not quite which is why I think that there is some argument uh, for 10 Hawks, because if once you get to 10 Hawks, like that unit can reliably just annihilate a light infantry unit holding something in your opponent's backfield, which re really limits how your opponent can um, move models around. 150 is a lot more than 75 points. And I will say that at 75 points, the ability to like finish off units that have retreated into the backfield or just jump onto an undefended objective. Again, like in ninth edition in the late game when there's not a lot left on the board, the ability to just pick your swooping hawks up on the end of your opponent's turn and put them on an undefended objective somewhere that doesn't have something within nine inches of it, that alone, are, is that's pretty good. Um, it is a real shame that you can't run seven of these things to change the math so that they uh, stand a really good chance of wiping out a unit of, I don't know, like Neurogaunts or um, Guardsmen or Cultists or something that might just stand on an objective out of the way. Now, if you are going to run the Hawks uh, as a squad of five and you want to be able to eliminate Light Infantry, there is a little bit of a workaround, um, which is, of course, to charge. You can use a Fate Die roll of a six, so if you come in nine inches from enemy models and you have a six on one of your... So I, I'm pretty sure the way fate dice works still is that uh, charge rolls are, are... You're rolling two dice, but it's treated as a single dice roll, so you could only manipulate one of the dice. But you could create a two-thirds chance of them getting in um, after a nine-inch charge, at which point uh, with that Eldari power sword on the Exarch, that's putting out three attacks... Weapon skill three, strength four, minus two AP, one damage. And then the other Hawks, like they're aspect warriors, they, they have two attacks each, uh, are putting out another eight attacks, strength three, no AP. But that is enough. Like if you succeed on the charge, that does, the fact that you have a two thirds chance of succeeding on the charge does mean that a squad of five Hawks stands a pretty good chance with the lethal hits also of like landing next to 10. Termagants, um, hosing them with shooting and then charging in to finish them. Uh, especially if they're like not every single gaunt model is on the objective and you can position them such that you're nine inches from some that are on the objective so your opponent can't just make the charge impossible based on how they pick up model. It's something to think about. Uh, but I do think there's an argument for 10 Hawks simply to change the math on that threat profile but their mobility makes them a, a really good tool again not as crazy as they were in the last edition but a really good tool for the points okay shining spears uh so shining spears have been darlings of the last couple of editions really all the way back for for eldar and they've they've taken it on the chin a little bit uh in this edition they're they're not bad 
compared to all the other stuff, uh, it's not great. They, um, all the other aspect warriors came down significantly on their point cost. Shining spears are still pretty expensive at, at 120 for three of them, 240 for six. Uh, and they definitely don't have the killing power that they used to. So, and I am personally deeply sad about what they did to the Paragon Saber um, because I love that model. I think it's really cool. And it is just the only thing you would ever put on your Exarch now is the Star Lance. I'm sorry, fellow elf players who also built a Shining Spear Exarch with the Paragon Saber. It is, it is, th there's no reason you would do that um, now. So uh, they their only ability is Aerobatic Grace. It's minus one to hit the unit. I don't know. I, it doesn't that break the rule where they're just going to call certain things the same thing? Isn't that just what they call stealth now? I don't, I don't know. But they're minus one to hit. Uh, they don't have any special abilities, really. Um, you can give the Exarch uh, a Shimmer Shield for free now. That's cool. So the whole squad's got that five up invuln that all Aspect Warriors have, but the Exarch has a four up invuln. And... Um, the Exarch still has three wounds. The others still have two wounds. They're still toughness four. Uh, they move 14. And they have the weapons. So um, the Laser Lance has, I think, exactly the same profile that it used to have. Uh, it's three attacks in melee, hitting on threes. Uh, it's got the Lance keyword, so it's strength four if you don't charge, strength six if you do minus two AP flat two damage um and then oh no their AP used to be better right the uh and then the um the shooting profile is the same the star lance which which only the exarch can take is strength nine when you're shooting with it uh it's still only strength six with, when you charge with it but it's minus three AP flat two and it hits on twos both in shooting and melee just making it objectively better so theoretically you could I guess still give your Exarch... Oh, no, you can't even give it the Star Lance anymore. You can give it the Saber or the... I'm sorry, the Laser Lance. The, the Saber or the Star Lance. The, uh, the Saber um, it gives you six attacks. So that's two more attacks than the Star Lance, but it hits on threes instead of twos. It doesn't shoot, and it has worse AP. So it's just objectively worse. Uh... The very, at the very least, they could have made it strength six all the time, so you don't have to it's not only if you charged like it's just bad which is sad uh so you know i mean spears they they pack a punch they're a they're a good anti-infantry especially heavy infantry melee unit they've still got the you can give the shuriken cannon to the exarch for free the shuriken catapults on the other bikes i mean it's a, it's a solid combat unit and if you if you're going to roll a flank in combination with other units you want something that's fast pretty hard hitting with some melee potential both melee and shooting um especially for newer players who are trying well i don't know man the problem with spears is that they're you have to be careful with how you position them because they're expensive enough they're, they're at this price point where it's a little bit hard to trade up with them and you definitely can't afford to have them caught flat-footed and lose them but in order to be close enough for them to do their thing, you have to hang them out there in a way that makes them pretty easy for your opponent to eliminate. Um, and Spears have always had all of these problems, but they basically, they have a similar cost to what they had before with, with significantly reduced killing power. And unlike all those infantry units, which are doing all of the infantry stuff, they're not really doing all of the infantry stuff. So they're, they're kind of in a weird spot. Um, I don't, kind of like fire dragons, I don't think that they're bad. I think that you could use them uh, quite effectively in, you know, a speed army that's going to try to roll one flank or the other, and they're certainly going to be good. Uh, they're certainly going to be good in that role. But like banshees can run straight through walls to get at your opponent's hard to reach infantry. Spears can't do that. Um, and now that flying units can no longer just like they have to measure onto the roof of something and then down off of the roof of something when they fly over it fly is kind of not as good as it used to be although you can now fly in the charge phase which is cool um i don't think that spears are one of the i don't think spears are one of the stronger units in the index i think we have a lot of better options 
I don't think they're bad. I just think that they're being outshined by other things. And I'm, and I'm mad about the Paragon Saber. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to reserve my right to be annoyed about that. So if, if you do have spears in your collection, like, don't worry about it, especially you people, you players who are listening to this and not like you play at your local game store and you don't go to tournaments. Your local game store is like a, a, a mixed meta and you're playing, you know, casual and mid-level competitive, like your, your spears are fine. They're not like you don't, don't be, you, you don't have to be upset that your spears are, are bad or something. Now they're not, they're just, uh, they're, I don't think they're going to make the grade for, um, most, uh, high level tournament play at least until we get uh, a codex. But I could be wrong. They're still pretty fast and hard hitting. I don't know. We'll see how it shakes out. Okay, warp spiders. Uh, warp spiders are really good. I, I think, again, I talked about these in the Kansas City reveal, but um, they're the fastest. Now it's confirmed, now that we've seen the data, data sheets. They're the fastest unit, uh, I think, available to us because although they have a, a move of 12... That you can in your movement fit when you make a normal move make it a, a move characteristic of 24 using flicker jump if you do this you have to roll a d6 afterwards and if you roll a one they take a mortal wound uh and as i said in a previous video you could just put that on the exarch and guarantee that they survive a unit of five warp spiders comes with six death spinners because there is an extra one on the exarch and those still have a 12 inch range they still do d6 attacks strength four no ap anymore but it's torrent and devastating wounds. So that's 6d6 auto hits, which is pretty freaking good. So on average, this is going to hit about 21 times. And then all of those are going to be strength four, uh, but all of this devastating wounds. So all of the sixes to wound will simply do mortals. So you're probably looking at three or four mortal wounds. Uh, that's that's pretty powerful. The ability to just put mortal wounds on anything means that like if you need to finish off a tank or a monster, they can they can do a little bit of extra damage. They can certainly just wipe out units of light infantry that your opponent is using uh, on objectives. The smaller units of heavy infantry, especially with the mortal wounds, um, they can really mess up. And having a 24 inch move, that's just really good. Uh, it's super quick. And the, the power blades are now free on the Exarch. They cannot charge in a turn in which they've done the 24 inch move thing. Um, the power blades are okay. Uh, weapon skill three, strength four, minus two AP, one damage, three attacks. Um, you know, you can get another wound or something through there. But uh, I, I don't think you're going to be charging a great deal with your warp spiders. They're 100 points. Now, I think the, the question here, the most obvious comparison, right, is going to be to Swooping Hawks, which are 75 points. Now, there's no doubt that uh, Warp Spiders are harder hitting than Hawks because they're going to auto hit with roughly the same number of shots that Hawks have. Um, Hawks don't have, Hawks have lethal hits, but they don't have devastating wounds. Devastating wounds is better. And... So spiders are just going to do more damage. They're going to do more damage to any target. Um, but are they a third again, the points worth it? Uh, spiders are faster and they're not limited by not being able to come in within nine inches of an opponent, but hawks can go anywhere uh, outside of nine inches. I think, I think that they both have play. Um, but at least for me, I think uh, I'm, I'm currently, I personally, I'm not saying that it's mutually excuse, exclusive, but if, if I could only have one, I am personally leaning Hawks. And I think that that might be, uh, I'm, I'm put over the edge by the, um, the, di the difference in points and the fact that Hawks can just go anywhere on the table uh, outside of nine inches, basically at the end of every turn. Because when I think about how I'm going to want to use them as like a threat to my opponent's backfield, 24 inches is really fast, but uh, I, I can't pick them up from one corner of the table and, and put them down on the other corner of the table to strip something off of. I, I just, I feel like the Hawks put more pressure on my opponent for fewer points. The uh, Spiders are a little bit more durable with a regular three up save instead of a four up save. They both have a five up invuln. Um, 
like that's not swinging it for me uh cover can no longer take you to a two up save anyway and so i can't have my spiders in cover getting a two up save it's not they're still just t3 elves with one wound it's not like they're durable and arguably the better damage output on the spiders solves the hawk problem like five hawks can't quite reliably kill like a squad of termagants um or well maybe not you know guardsmen or something i don't know um they 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 can kill that squad but it's not maybe it's not quite as reliable as you'd like it to be five spiders probably can uh and so i was talking before about how wouldn't it be nice if you could take like seven hawks and you could be thinking to yourself but brent you literally said you wanted to be able to pay 100 points for swooping hawks and have them do a little bit more damage isn't that what spiders are with a better saving throw and to you i say you were very clever and that is a reasonable response but really what puts me over the edge is that redeployability i think the 24 inch move on the spiders is great but i have to have them sitting within 24 inches of where i want them to be in my opponent's backfield in order for that threat to be real for my opponent and in order to do that and not have them out in the open where my opponent can just kill them um i also like that you can attach baharath maybe to the hawks and and have them do that thing where they teleport into your opponent's backfield shoot something and then step out of line of sight so i think spiders are really good i think i prefer hawks and that really just might be a personal play style preference thing um maybe not uh maybe not that they're objectively better i historically have just i to be i I do, I'm, I'd never used warp spiders especially well. I don't know why. I feel like I understand all the theory. Um, they've never performed well for me. I love I love the models, even though they're super out of date. Uh, I love the lore. I love the fluff. I've brought them to plenty of games. Um, so this it might just be a personal preference thing. But I'm I'm leaning hawks. So that's what I've got. Uh, in my in my next video, I'm going to talk about the vehicles and the wraith units, and then I'll do another video in which I talk about uh, corsairs, harlequins. Yunari and whatever left, uh, and 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 we'll we'll wrap up the index review. Uh, if you liked this video, I hope that you will click like. If you have not yet subscribed, I hope that you will subscribe. And if you felt compelled to support me on Patreon, I sure would appreciate it. Uh, you get access to my Discord, which is a really lively community of people talking about the hobby at all different levels of play. Um, you also. Uh, it can download content and listen to it like a podcast most of the time you also get early access to stuff except when it's really time sensitive like this video uh and you also get my thanks that's at the most basic level there are two higher levels you can also get an opportunity to um see your units in videos and at the the highest level the phoenix lord level um, i also prioritize correspondence if you want me to look at lists and stuff uh but mostly those levels just um, are, you know, even nicer and, and make me feel really good about uh, your support. So um, I'll link the patron in the video description just in case you feel inspired. But really also just leaving a comment, that's a big help to the algorithm. And I also just like seeing the conversations um, unfold around this content because obviously it's the thing I'm really interested in. So that's where we are. Uh, it's looking really good for Space Elves in, in 10th edition. Some people say too good. Uh, I think at least with a couple of the tricks with certain data cards and the fate dice, that is possible. You know, we might we might be in for um, seeing a couple things walked back a little bit. And so let's definitely enjoy while we can. But also we haven't we haven't gotten a lot of games in yet. Like maybe it will turn out to be totally fine. It's hard to know whether or not factions are balanced well against one another until we actually play with them on the table. That said, Admac, I feel your pain, which is a phrase I've literally never said in my entire life. All right, that's it. Hope to be back again in a day or so with uh, part two of this video. Until then, uh, best of luck with your space elves. And if you have gotten some games of 10th edition in, I'd love to hear about those in the comments below. Take care. Bye.